Hi, and welcome to the next lecture unit in the lecture chapter on support vector machines, which is on soft margin support vector machines. And soft margin support vector machines um, are simply an extension or a relaxation of the hard margin, which we discussed before. So now I will um, get rid of this assumption that my data is inherently linearly separable because that's not really reasonable or realistic to assume, right? And we'll figure out um, how to do this here. So, of course, data can look like this, right? Doesn't have to be linearly separable. Um, if it's not, then we can't solve this hard margin SVM problem anymore because for the hard margin SVM, and um, we had this feasible region and the feasible region said that we have to classify each single point correctly through a linear hyperplane. This is obviously not possible anymore. And in that, in that case, our optimization problem for the hard margin SVM will simply have an empty feasible region. So it's completely not solvable for us. So we somehow now have to change the optimization problem. We have to actually discuss what a reasonable change should be so we can still talk about something like an optimal solution to such a problem, what an optimal linear classifier could look like. And our approach will work um, as following. So we still want to have a large margin. So um, we still think that this is a reasonable principle, but we don't want to um, uh, require that this large margin now um, yeah, accounts or is constructed with respect to all of the instances. Um, it's only constructed now with respect to most of the examples. And we will therefore now allow violations of this margin constraint. So our margin constraint looked like this, right? So it was yi times the score fi. And this was supposed to be um, larger than or equal than 1. And that's this would imply that all of our points here are lying outside of that safety region in the positive half space and in the negative half space. And we'll now allow that some points actually violate that constraint and we'll just kind of artificially allow that by introducing so-called slack variables, um, xi i. So we'll simply say, hey, there's another variable, another decision variable, xi i, with, which is non-negative. And for some of the examples where we can't make it work, right, where this inequality constraint here is not fulfilled, well, we'll simply allow xi i to take a a certain hopefully smallish value and then this constraint here this inequality can still be fulfilled of course we'd rather not have that happen too often and of course we usually want these xi i's here to be as small as possible um, because uh, otherwise yeah this large margin concept completely vanishes right if we allow violations everywhere with a super large value then we have completely lost this geometric principle um, that we introduced for the hard margin SVM. Um, and actually, just as a little side comment, even for separable data, a decision boundary with a few violations, um, think, for example, about outliers and so on, um, might actually make sense because um, a large average margin may actually be preferable um, with a few violations, might actually be preferable to one without any violations and which only has a small margin, small geometric margin. So even in the separable case, um, such an approach that I'm explaining here might be interesting. So um, in terms of the visualization here, you here see the positive points, you see here the negative points, you can see how we still compute these um, distances to the hyperplane. So this would be the gamma. Um, and here you now can see for example, for, mm, 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 let's check that. So for example, for this point here, now we compute the distance to the, um, uh, to the margin. And this distance to the margin now is exactly here, this, this xi i, if we are, if our point is located on the wrong side of the margin. Yeah, so this point here is already inside of the margin. That should not happen, right? All of the Negative guys here of the green guys, they should lie out of the margin. So exactly this little distance here, this is um, what we have to account for to make this point actually feasible. So this distance here must now be associated with xi i. 
And for this guy here, it's even worse. So the point is not even on the wrong side of the margin, it's even on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So um, it has an even larger Xi i. And yeah, the gamma is this here. So um, yeah, that's kind of defined as before. That doesn't change. And we now have to unfortunately optimize two distant, distinct and uh, also contradictory goals. So we still want to maximize the margin as before, but we also now, well, we can't allow arbitrary margin violations as I explained before. So we also want to minimize our margin violations. Um, there shouldn't be too many and they should be of uh, hopefully smallish size. So we already know how to maximize the margin. Did that in the previous lecture unit. But how do we now minimize these margin violations? So these Xi i's here, yeah? so if they are non-zero, they express exactly these margin violations. Yeah? So the more we have of um, large size, the more we are violating our um, margin constraints. So how about we simply sum up these Xi i guys here and then we say the sum should actually be quite small. So in the best case, all of the Xi i's would actually be zero and then the sum would also be zero. And if some are non-zero and they are of smallish value, then the sum here is also not too bad. And in order now for us to marry these two objectives, we'll simply add them together as a weighted sum. So this is the easiest way of um, combining two objectives. It's actually not, wouldn't be the only way to approach this type of problem, but it's um, certainly, um, I guess, the most simple way. So we'll simply combine the two objectives, multiply the second part with a control parameter C, and this control parameter C now helps us to kind of reweight these two objectives so we can, through C, control whether we actually care more about driving these margin violators here down or whether we rather care about a very, very large margin. And you can see that depicted here in uh, these two um, examples where I have taken on both sides the same data situation. And again, we have uh, marked here and visualized uh, the sizes of the Xi i uh, margin violations. We have also marked here the gamma, which is the half size of our margin. Um, and of course, you can also see here the location of our hyperplane. And I have now solved these two problems um, once with a C of quite low value and once with a C of quite high value. So if the C is of quite high value, so in this case 100, and what that means is that we care a lot more, we give a lot more to this second part of the objective, which means we really don't like these margin violations too much. And as you can see, there's a lot less margin violations happening here on the right hand side than on the left hand side, and they are also of smaller values. So if you would add this up, this up, this and this, this gives you a much smaller value than adding this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, um, a lot of uh, this is yeah, a lot of uh, Xi i terms we have to sum up. Um, and the reason is that here, because of this uh, yeah, large control parameter, we really tell the optimizer to drive down this second term here. On the other hand, um, for the left hand side, um, we give more relative weight now to the size here of the margin. And you can also see that because of that here, the gamma is actually larger than on the right hand side. And also, um, yeah, of course, um, although the positions here of the hyperplane in the middle are somewhat similar, they are not exactly the same. I guess you can best maybe see this down here, yeah, where. Um, here, the hyperplane is actually on the right-hand side of that blue guy in here, and here yeah, on the left-hand side, or nearly going through the point. And tying this now all together, we write down our new combined objective that I explained before. We now have more decision variables to take care of. So we also have these Xi i's here as decision variables, so that's a bit annoying. Our side constraints are also slightly changed. Yeah? So here we are now using these slack variables 
And we now also have new extra side constraints because the Xi i's all must be non-negative. And this convex quadratic program, so it's still a convex quadratic program. This is um, linearly and quadratic in theta and the Xi i's and these are all still linear side constraints and uh, some even simpler box constraints. This primal program here, we will call from now on the linear soft margin SVM. And we can now, again, please do this with pen and paper, and this might take a few minutes longer, but it's not difficult, especially if you have already solved it for the hard margin SVM, we can now arrive, derive in exactly the same manner as for the hard margin case, the dual formalization and the dual formulation. And it looks also nearly exactly the same as for the hard margin SVM. So this guy here is the same. This guy here is also the same. And this is nearly the same. So before for the hard margin, we had that these here, the alpha vector must be um, non-negative. So we had this uh, single, we had this, uh, with this left hand side of the box construct strains here already there, but for the soft margin SVM, we also now know that the alpha i's must be constrained from above by the C, by the con um, control constant C. So this is this here is the only thing that changes in the dualization. And again, we can write down matrix notation, I explained this before. So um, it also looks nearly exactly the same. I'm just again, a more compact form, um, yeah, which is, um, yeah, I guess, quite useful also to have um, seen. A few extra comments on this cost parameter. So this cost parameter, as I explained, controls this trade-off between the two conflicting objectives, um, whether we want to maximize the size of the margin or whether we rather want to minimize the uh, frequency and the size of the margin violations. Um, we call this constant C, yeah, C, so sometimes call it cost, call so we can call it the trade-off parameter, we can call it the regularization parameter, and we can, can uh, call it the complexity control parameter. And I guess you can also see um, pretty directly from the terminology where that is leading us. Um, and I'll discuss exactly this connection to regularized risk minimization uh, very, very uh, soonishly in uh, one of the next lecture units. And if we set our C sufficiently large enough, then all of our margin violations will become extremely costly. So if you look at this here, so if you set C to, I don't know, a million or whatever, then at least for some very large value of C, all of these margin violations will become so costly that if your data set is actually linearly separable, then none of these Xi i's here would be non-zero, there would be no margin violations and you would still arrive at a um, hyperplane which separates the data and which has, because there, there, there's, there are no, no margin violations, which will simply optimize, maximize the size of the margin. So. This is then the same result as for your hard margin problem. So in a certain sense, you can uh, say that the soft margin SVM contains the hard margin SVM for linearly separable data as a special case. Uh, so the only thing um, you need to do is you need to set C to a large enough value and then, um, for example, inspect your dual solution. Um, or no, sorry, um, actually inspect your primal solution, inspect whether all of the Xi i's are indeed zero, and then you know that you have obtained um, a hard margin yeah, solution. Final comments about support vectors, because um, yeah, we discussed this before. Um, again, through the dualization, you can perform the same inspection of the Karoš contact conditions and now figure out the following. So for soft margin SVM, solutions, there's exactly three types of 
different training examples. You can categorize them nicely. So there's non-support vectors and these non-support vectors have a margin which is larger than one. So these non-support vectors are exactly these guys where you have a zero xi i value and these can be removed from the problem again without changing the solution. So these are here um, the uh, guys where we have used the, the alpha blending um, in the plot, so which are a little bit translucent. Um, some support vectors are located exactly on the margin and they have exactly here this uh, y times f thing equals one going on. Yeah, this was is as before as for the um, hard margin SVM. And now we have a third category of points. There's also other support vectors, which are margin violators. So where um, this y times f here is exactly smaller than one, and they have an associated positive slack variable xi i, which is um, strictly larger than zero. So these are misclassified points. Um, no, sorry, sorry. These are margin violators, um, and they, for them, two cases now can happen. They can be margin violators on the correct side of the hyperplane. Now, so this xi i here tells you whether they are violating this margin constraint, um, and if this xi i is actually larger than one, right? So here it would be nearly zero, here it would be 0.5, and here you're kind of approaching one, and if you are um, yeah, going beyond the one, then the points are actually misclassified, so this would happen for this guy here, so this might have a xi i value of maybe, I don't know, 1.2 or something like this, okay? So now, from the scores and from the xi i's, and the alpha values, you can easily figure out um, whether points are support vectors, non-support vectors, or support vectors uh, which violate the margin or have um, are even yeah on the wrong side of the hyperplane and misclassified. What you can also see from this is that um, um, yeah we we'll later discuss a bit more that um, I mean the SVM actually becomes sparse in terms of the weights of the training data. So what we actually like is if many of these alpha i values here become exactly zero. Um, unfortunately, as you can see that if points are misclassified, for example, yeah, so if your data set, for example, has a very, very high base error and you must therefore misclassify many points and all of these misclassified points will immediately become support vectors and your resulting support vector machine will therefore not become very sparse. Not many of these um, alpha weights will actually be driven down to exactly zero. Um, 